ערב טוב מבורך רבותיי, ערב טוב. בעזרת השם, first of all, בזכות הצדיק רבי חיים פינטו, בזכות כל הצדיקים, הקדוש ברוך הוא בעזרת השם הוא בלס, our entire קהל, our entire קהילה, with big ברכה והצלחה, סייעתא דשמיא גדולה, מלכא דמוי וחתם וזקיעתם, בעזרת השם הקדוש ברוך הוא open up the gates of פרנסה, and the gates of רפואה, and the gates of שמחה, and the gates of אושר, and the gates of זיווג, and הקדוש ברוך הוא בעזרת השם מוספר לנו שפעת בלידיי, protect us בעזרת השם on any עין הרע או מעין הפקרה, and bring us בעזרת השם to a place of complete גאולה, from a personal perspective, גאולה פרטית, and גאולה of all כלל עם ישראל, אמן כן יצאו בעזרת השם. הנה רבותיי, ברוך השם, this week's פרשה, is maybe one of the most, or you could even say the most, important parasha without the entire Torah kula. Being the parasha of not only Geulat Am Yisrael, the redemption of who we are as a people, but also being the parasha, that we call it parashat ha'emunah, the parasha of the faith. Where all faith of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that exists and is embedded within Am Yisrael, all comes out from this week's parasha. So we can see why this week, being the week of the parasha, is truly a week of Geulah. That is why many Mekubalim wrote different segulot and different things we can do to bring within our own life redemption throughout this week, or to cause already the influence of redemption that is embedded in this period of time to just influence us and to lead us within our own personal life. There are many different segulot, some being reading Kriyat uh, Yamsuf twice on Monday and Thursday, some being uh, reading it every single day, some being uh, reading it all three tefillot, meaning three times a day. Many different segulot that each one uh, represents a different form of like Giyula. Something that is very interesting that today we see, that is one of the most popular uh, segulot that exists of this week, is the segula of what? Of reaching to great panasa, where we are sure that everybody received 20 people, this segula and this mitzvah of doing what? Yeah. Of reading on Tuesday, the third day of the week, of Beshalach, Parashat Haman. And every single year we all flock to read it, <laughs> being that it's the, a segula, that we will bring abundance and redemption of panasa within our own life. This got us thinking of this concept of a great connection between wealth, a valuable panasa, and this concept of this week's parasha being Geulat Am Yisrael, or more specifically, Yetziat Mitzrayim. Being, this week we do Segulot for Panasa. Also being that the Gemara and Masechet Psachim completely, clearly compares Kriyat Yam Suf to what? To Panasato Shel Adam. And we say, Kashe Ze Panasato Shel Adam, Ki Kriyat Yam Suf. So there is some sort of correlation. So the question that we had is, is there some sort of a meaning behind this correlation? And what really could we understand of bringing wealth and accumulating shefa within our own life? So maybe we could try to, to imitate it or to copy it or to bring it to ourselves. So in order to understand this, we have to look a little bit deeper within the parasha to find more, maybe a clear associations between this concept of reaching to great panasa and accumulating wealth to the Geulat of Am Yisrael. Because initially it's something that is not clear. We found two places within this week's parasha that gives a very, very clear direction and connection between the wealth of a man to Geulat of Israel. What is that? One being a very, very strange concept that we see within the Torah. We said that Kadosh Baruch Hu inflicts Egypt with nine makot, nine different plagues. And each plague is completely unique and strange and different, and you could even call it awesome, to try to bring Am Israel to a place of one, having them full with emunah, and also bringing the Egyptians to a place of breaking their control and their impurity that they held within the world at that period of time. What's very unique is the last message that Hashem gives Moshe before bringing the tenth Makkah, the last plague, which is what? Hashem comes to Moshe and he tells Moshe, you know Moshe Rabbeinu, I have one more hit. But this hit will be a very, very unique hit. It will be a hit that I will not send you. I will not send Aaron. 
I will not send an angel. Ani velo malach, ani velo saraf, ani velo shaliach, ani velo acher. I will not send anyone. It's a plague that I will bring. The plague of what? The plague of makat? Bechorot. Or in English, it's the, the, the plague of what? The firstborn. Hashem tells Moshe, once the plague of the firstborn starts, tell him Israel to go to every Egyptian home and start borrowing money and gold and jewelry and valuable. So, when hearing this pasuk, we come to two unclear ideas. First of all, why is the firstborn plague a plague that HaKadosh Baruch himself wants to do? Meaning it's a plague that him himself wants to bring a, a, this plague to fruition and not sending it by a, a shaliach, a messenger, or Moshe and Aaron, which was very unique to all the ten plagues. And second of all, what's the connection between going and accumulating wealth and money from the Egyptians to this plague of Makat Bechorot? There are two different things that are completely separate and have nothing to do. Our second correlation or idea that we could understand wealth with Yitziat Mitzrayim and Yitzvik Parasha being how the Egyptians prepared themselves for Yitziat Mitzrayim. The Midrash, the Midrash in Yakut Shimon, he says that when the Egyptians were going to chase Bnei Israel, they got dressed in a very unique way. You would think when you go to war, what do you wear? You wear armor, you wear... Uh, you try to be as light as possible with having as much protection as possible. And you go with a goal of either fighting or either capturing, whatever it is. The Midrash says that when the Egyptians went to war, they did something very unique. What did they do? The Midrash says they wore their jewelry. They filled their pockets with as much money and gold as they can fill. They wore the most expensive valuables that they had in their possession. And they chased Am Yisrael. So, Bichlal, you can ask, what was going through their minds to do such a strange thing? But we see right afterwards, we know that when Bnei Israel drowned in Kriyat Yamsuf, that we're going to see this Pasha, what happened? All the Egyptians, fl they floated to shore. And what did Am Israel do? They went on shore and they emptied out and they completely cleaned all those valuables that the Egyptians so kindly delivered to them. So there is a clear correlation connection between a person reaching to great panasa and wealth and great statue to this week's pasha. So what is it and what can we do to really achieve this concept of accumulating this wealth and this uh, abundance of material objects? Now, before we even get to the class, we believe that there's something very important we have to make very, very clear. We're coming to a class of Shio Torah. Why does this have anything to do with accumulating uh, valuables and wealth. Isn't that something that goes essentially against the Torah to a certain degree? Isn't that a Jew is supposed to be simple and, uh, and uh, not wear anything valuable and just connect to spirituality and complete, completely make ourselves into malachim? And if that's the case, how does a class like this have any place within our knowledge of Torah? And the answer is something very simple and very, very clear. And this is actually a teaching that Zohar Kedush brings regarding what we perceive and what we see as valuables. A lot of the times, we look at a valuable like gold, diamond, leathers, or whatever it is, and we see it as something that is valuable that our eyes or man dictated for it. But the Zohar says actually, in money or in gold or in all valuables, there is actually a very, very spiritual aspect hidden within it that from the first place caused it to be valuable. Meaning that what? That all valuable things have an extremely big spiritual uh, side to it. And that spiritual side to it is actually what causes us to stick on it such a valuable price tag in the first place. Such as what? Zohar Kedu says that when HaKadosh Baruch created gold, his intention wasn't just to just create a very shiny material. There was a purpose for it. What was the purpose for it? The Zohar Kedush quotes a Gemara that says that the whole essence of even the creation of gold was what? Was for one reason. Was for the kelim, the utensils and the tools of what? Bet HaMikdash and the Mishkan. <laughs> Where gold was created for that. If gold was created for that reason, so it would make sense that that material holds what? A big spiritual Entity, a very big spiritual importance, a big spiritual side. 
So being that it holds a big spiritual side, you could start to understand why we, even if we know it or if we don't do, know it, see value within it. Because in reality, it's just a color. So what's so different about this color? So based off this, it's very simple. Based off this, we understand that our attraction to it and our pull to want to have it and our pull to want to acquire that and to, um, uh, um, uh, to, uh, to amass a, a multiple amount of that doesn't necessarily come from the reason that we think. Of our eyes, our touch, our feel for no reason. It comes from the essence that our neshama has an attraction to it, being that spiritual and holds a spiritual richness. And we just have the ex- attraction without even knowing why we're attracted to it. And this is something that is applicable to all valuable things. There's a Gemara that says that diamond was created for Bet HaMikdash Diamonds, they were only created for the third Bet HaMikdash. Being that they were created for the third Bet HaMikdash, they hold a lot of spirituality within it. Being that they hold the spirituality, we could only imagine why a person is pulled to it. And like we mentioned, that is with all valuables. That answers why in Bet HaMikdash, there were so many valuable things. It was a place that it looked like a complete uh, museum. It was all gold and leathers and coppers and silvers and diamonds and rubies. Why would you put so many essentially material objects in such a spiritual place. It's a little bit goes against the logic of on one side saying it's the home of spirituality and it being so materialistic. No, it's the exact opposite. That because those objects share a spiritual character, from the first place they were chosen to have value in our eyes, but more importantly, a place within a spiritual use, such as Bet HaMikdash or whatever it is. Zohar Kadosh in another place, Hints in this teaching, even with Imat. And this is to really seal this concept that things that we are attracted to, even physical, don't just come from our physical desire or physical need. They come from a place of having a spiritual um, uh, characteristics that make us pull to it regardless if we understand it or not. Zohar says the same thing about the Imat. With regards to our matriarchs, there's many questions about it. How it says like, Yaakov fell in love with Rachel. Or it says that he looked at her and he said she was very beautiful. Or it says about Avram, that Avram looked at Sarah and said she was very beautiful. So initially when we hear this, we say we, say, we don't understand. Our patriarchs being the Avot were such men of Torah and spirituality and Akadosh Baruch Hu, How can they be attracted to such a, essentially materialistic thing? And the answer being that that's not the case at all. Were the Imaot, they were attraction to all men, being that they had such a bright neshama and such a spiritual richness that all men that saw the imat, they were pulled to them. Whether or not they understood or didn't understood that that attraction came from a spiritual aspect. That was the reality of it. So, to conclude, we have to understand that when talking about amassing wealth or amassing uh, valuables, in its essence, it comes from a spiritual source, a spiritual um, entity b- behind it. If we could only understand the spirituality behind it and what causes those specific things to be attracted to certain places, we could only imagine how we can bring Shef and Panasa within our own life. Being that it's not just about being smart at business, but it's understanding the spiritual value behind these things. And if we can do so, we could amass a humongous amount of shefa. Now, of course, this shefa is not used um, with any Jew for no reason, but it's used to do Avodat HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which is something that we will get into throughout the class. So before we even open up on this subject, it's very, very important for us to understand. When talking about wealth or about these uh, very, very mm-hmm. valuable objects, we are referring to the spiritual uh, value they hold within them. And we will explain and we understand all these moving parts as, um, as the shiur uh, gets built and comes together. In order to understand those two questions that we asked previously with regard to the giwila and reaching to a great level of panasam, we have to understand something very important that essentially attaches directly to B'nai Yisrael becoming wealthy. And that being what? That being Hashem coming down to the world, first of all, 
glorifying the firstborn, as well as killing the firstborns of the Egyptians, and allowing Bnei Israel from here and out to start accumulating, accumulating wealth. If we want to understand this concept of Hashem telling Bnei Israel from now on you could accumulate wealth, maybe if we understand what came beforehand, we'll understand why they have some sort of connection. So, in order to understand this concept of how we could achieve wealth, we have to first come to a deeper level of knowledge on this concept of what is firstborn. And this concept of firstborn is something very unique. Being that we see that throughout the entire Torah, there is like a specific uh, kavod, extra uh, respect, honor, or even you can call it spirituality that lies within the firstborn. So what is it? Zohar Kadosh says that there's something very, very unique, and a very, very simple reason why firstborn are very, very uh, blessed, or very, very held at a high statue. Being that the Bria, meaning the creation, the Zohar Kadosh says, always searches and desires to reach to its root. What does that mean? The Zohar Kadosh says, all creations, animals, objects, whatever it is, at any given moment, it's in the nature of the entire creation, meaning all creations, to be attracted, to be pulled to where they came from. And the reason that they're attracted to be pulled to where they came from, being that where they came from is the purest form of what they are as a creation. Now, Zohar Kadosh says, what is the root of the creation? So the Zohar answers and it says, it's usually the firstborn. Why firstborn? Because firstborn, Becho, like in that name that we call it, is the first. First being beginning. Beginning also can be used as or referred to as the root. So it's like you look at a tree. If you want to understand how the tree got to where it got to, you go to where it started in the beginning. What was the initial stage of it becoming a tree? That first stage is the root of how the tree got to where it got to. So in its essence, Zohar Kadu says that all creation are always pulled to the root. The root being the beginning, the beginning being the firstborn. Because the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth of the creations are a repercussion of what? Of the first. So within the second and the third and the fourth, there is a piece of the first, which is a minority that exists within it, that is essentially uh, what makes it so great. Without the first, you'll never reach the second. Without the second, you'll never reach the third, etc. So the question is, because we're all thinking right now, what does this mean that all the Bria, all the creation get attracted to the first, meaning achieves to reach to its root? How does that actually um, um, come to a place of fruition? So Zohar Kadosh is something very simple. It says the reason that all the creation is attracted always to the first, being that the first holds an abundance of Kedusha. Where the amount of Kedusha in presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that lies within the first or the beginning is uncomparable to what exists throughout all the other creations. Being that the first holds within it a great amount of spirituality, the Zohar Kadu says, the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth, in their nature, are pulled to it. Why are they pulled to it? Because in every single creation, there is a spark. But that spark being very, 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 very minority compared to the physical body. And that spark, being a minority, seeks to reach to a place of coming to a shlemut, being complete. Because it's a minority within a physical being, within a physical creation. So within every creation, its instinct is to be pulled, to be attracted to where there is an abundance of presence of Hashem. And that abundance of presence of Hashem can cause that spark within the bigger amount of physical to come to a place of shlimut, of being um, complete, of being like um, wholesome. So the question is, what is this firstborn within the world that we essentially are looking at 
as what all the other creations are pulled to in order to reach to Hashem. What is that concept that exists within the world that we can take an example for of understanding really what is being a firstborn? So the Zohar Kadosh says, the firstborn within the world is who? Is who? Am Yisrael. Where can we learn this? We can learn this from the first wording of the Torah. As we know, the first wording of the Torah is Bereshit para Elokim, meaning at first, the beginning, Hashem started to create. At first being what? Being the firstborn. First being what? Being the root. The root being what attracts all. Zohar Kadosh says that what is the firstborn of the world? Am Yisrael, B'nai Yisrael. And that's what Rashi actually interpretates the first wording of the Torah. What does Rashi say? Rashi says, Kodesh Israel Reshit Tevuato. Which we can always ask when we, see, when we read this Pirush of Rashi, what's the connection between B'nai Israel or Kodesh being the first of its crop? So from here we can understand that what is the first? The first being what accumulates and what holds within it the most spirituality. And because it holds the most spirituality, in its essence, it holds this level of what? Being firstborn. And this is why we see all firstborns we give to Hashem. The first of our crops we give to Hashem, being that they hold within it too much spirituality. So in order to essentially bring a reparation to the, the, the creation or the tree or the fruit, we take the firstborn and we give it to HaKadosh Baruch being that it collects all the sparks within the tree and it brings it up to the place where they're supposed to be. Being the same thing with the firstborn of a child. There's a concept of, uh, of uh, every single first boy within a family. No, no. It's given to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's even this concept within a, a donkey or within a cow. That the firstborn of the donkey, you don't keep it for yourself. You give it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the same thing in so many different mitzvot that we see in the Torah. With the firstborn being that it holds within it an abundance of Kedushah that none of the second or the third or the fourth hold, it's given to Hashem as creating a pipe where all its repercussions being the second, third, and fourth could have that path, that pipe to reach HaKadosh Baruch from the first place. Being that the second and the third and the fourth have a minority spark, having a much, much smaller spiritual presence than the first. Am Yisrael is that firstborn. Am Yisrael's job in the world, and its tikkun in the world, is to be that beacon of spirituality that collects all the other sparks within all the other creations and gives it a chance to reach to Shlemut. Gives it a chance to reach to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Where our job in this world is not to just sit and uh, uh, surround ourselves only uh, uh, with air and saying, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm only with you. There are mitzvot to do. There are brachot to do. There are things we have to accomplish. Those things that we have to accomplish are almost always associated with what? With the creation. With the birya. Being that our job is to take all the sparks that are hidden within all material objects and to allow them to reach HaKadosh Baruch Hu be shlemut. And that is why there's even Zohar that says that when a person goes up to Shamaim, they ask him, did you eat this fruit? And we're asked, why, why does Hashem make such a big deal of asking every single fruit whether or not he ate it or he didn't? Did you eat this meat? Did you eat this? Did you enjoy from the world? Did you go here? Did you go there? Zohar Marash says it, asks us, why didn't we enjoy from all the aspects of the world? So it's clearly not because Hashem wants us to uh, just have fun for no reason. It clearly comes from the aspect of when we live in this world and when we essentially use the biriya or uh, essentially, uh, the Biriya wor works for us, the creations work for us. It actually comes with a great help to those creations. In what form? In the form of taking their spark that's hidden within them and bringing them to Shlemut, to a place of being complete. And that is something that we can talk about for hours upon hours, about behind the reason of why we eat meat and why we do specific mitzvot and why Sefer Torahs are made out of leather and not out of any more uh, pure, clean material. We can find a thousand different um, um, explanations we can give or different sources that we can try to, to put together to really see how our job comes from the simple reality of using the Biriyah 
in order to complete it with HaKadosh Baruch Where we see this concept, and specifically with man come to fruition, or the job of man being taken upon us, actually starts with the first man. First man being who? Adam Arishon. You can also see why HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose to call him Arishon. Rishon being a reference for what? Bechor. What's Bechor? Firstborn. Firstborn meaning that holding within it what? An abundance of spirituality that does not exist any place else. And that is why Adam was called Adam Arishon. Being that Adam was the first creation that held a neshama, a ruach, chaya, yichida, nefesh, an abundance of spirituality of HaKadosh Baruch. Zohar HaKadosh says, when Adam Arishon was created, being so abundant, being the firstborn, being the bechor, being the root, being the beginning, naturally, all the animals were very attracted to Adam. Well, Zohar HaKadosh even says that all the animals came forward to Adam and they got confused whether or not Adam is a creation or whether he's the creator, whether he's the Kadosh Baruch himself. To the point where it said that on the sixth day, all the animals came to Adam and they started to bow to him. What did that mean, bow? They started to worship him. Being that they truly thought that he was a Kadosh Baruch Hu. There's no blame given to them, being that Adam held Tzelem Eloki, the shape of God, um, he had the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu emanating from him. The whole world uh, was lit not by the sun at the time, it was lit by Adam's purity. So it's very easy for all those animals to come forward and to worship Adam Arishon. Zohar HaKadosh says that when Adam Arishon saw that all these animals are flocking to him to worship him, he understood that he has a part to play with this attraction that all the creations and all the animals have towards him. So what did Adam Arishon do? Zohar HaKadosh said that Adam Arishon called all the animals. He told all the animals, he said, creations, it's not me you're supposed to be worshipping. The attraction that you have towards me, it's not because I am Borei Olam. It's because I have the spirituality. I am like the pipeline that can help guide you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to a place of shlimut, of being wholesomeness with that spark minority that you hold within it. So what did Adam Arishon do? Zohar HaKadosh he told all the animals, don't worship me. It's all sing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's all worship HaKadosh Baruch Hu together. And that's what it says that on Friday, Hashem, Adam and all the animals got together and they sang the song, Hashem go, I don't want to say the name, Hashem go, Levesh Levesh Hashem, Oorit Azaraf Tikon Tevel Batimon. It's a song that we read every single Friday. It's Shir Shel Yom. What's Shir Shel Yom? The Mizmor, the Psalm, of the day. We read it in Shacharit, we read it in Micha, and we read it at Arvit. What is that, this song? It's a song that Adam and all the animals sing together, worshipping Akadosh Baruch Hu. That, in its essence, is our job in the world. Our job is understanding that being that we hold an abundance of spirituality, meaning that we have the responsibility to act like the firstborn, it's not enough just to be the firstborn of holding that extra presence of Hashem. But you have to put work into it. That work is doing what? That work is taking that attraction that the creations and that the Beriah has to a person and not doing a mistake of collecting it from himself, but understanding that his job is to do what? Is to direct all the creation and that spark within them that's pulling them towards him to HaKadosh Baruch. And when a person understands that that is our job in the world of pulling all creations and helping them reach HaKadosh Baruch Hu or helping HaKadosh Baruch Hu complete them, that is when a person comes to a place of shlemut, of wholesomeness, even within the world. And this actually explains many different things throughout the entire Torah. There's a concept that Chazal teach of HaTzadik Balair. What does that mean? means that the tzaddik is coming to the city. The chassidim, you see this concept that the biggest mikul in the chassidim would mention this sentence. The tzaddik came to the city. The tzaddik came to the city. The tzaddik came to the city. Why were the tzaddikim traveling from city to city? What was their goal? What were they trying to achieve? It's a little bit strange. When, as a tzaddik, you're supposed to be sitting and studying. They're going from one city to the next. Why were they doing this? 
So we said, maybe you can understand from the essence of what happened when the tzaddik comes to the city, the reason and the goal was put there. And what is that? What happens when the tzaddik comes to the city? All the city flocks to him. All the city is attracted to him. All the people come close to the tzaddik. All the people want to see the tzaddik. All the people want to get a bracha from the tzaddik. Why is that? Why is it that when a, ho a holy man comes to the city, all creations um, flock to him from every single corner? It comes from the simple teaching that we just mentioned. The tzaddik being like what represents firstborn or being an abundance of spirituality, pulls the little nishama or the little spark of the kirusha that lies within all of us towards him as a beacon of hope to bring our little nishama or our little spark of spirituality to a place of wholesomeness. And that is why it says that when tzaddik comes to the city, the city gets bright with light. Being that every single spark and every single nishama that is held within every single person gets bright and it comes to a place of wholesomeness. And that brings us to the exact same concept that you mentioned before. The tzaddik, Adam, in his essence was meant to stand and to let the creation flock to him and worship him. But that worshipness was not towards him. But what? A vessel that needed to be redirected to who? To HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And that's where we see this concept of where the tzaddik completes the city. And we're going to mention a little reference here. It's important because it's going to make things more clear in a moment. We can see this concept even with Yaakov, Yaakov Avinu Alav HaShalom. The Torah says, Vayetze Yaakov, Yaakov left the city. Why do we care if he left the city? It wasn't even the city of tzaddikim. To say Yaakov left, he traveled. Why he left the city? You'd say he didn't exit. Because the Torah says, to make it emphasize, that when the tzaddik leaves, when the tzaddik comes to the city, all creations flock to him to become complete when their spiritual uh, spark within them. And when the tzaddik leaves the city, what happens? All the light, all the gdula, and all the shefa that the tzaddik brings to, essentially, that city dimmers down. It comes to a much uh, <coughs> lower state. To go back to what we were mentioning, the job in our world as B'nai Adam, as Bechorim, as firstborn, is the essence of having the creation work for us, worship us, and pulling that attraction that the creation has to us and directing it to HaKadosh Baruch And we can really see this with the tzaddik that actually, to a certain degree, um, completed one of the acts of Adam Arishon. Being who? Being Yosef HaTzadik. What is Yosef HaTzadik? We know that Yosef HaTzadik, in his essence of Yerida, of the descent to Egypt, was completing Hashem's Tikkun. But in his entire journey throughout Egypt, we really see this concept of Adam being firstborn and his responsibility and his job and his ability shine like, uh, like no other place. In what sense? We see Yosef HaTzadik comes to Mitzrayim. And with it, what comes to the city? With the Mitzrayim? Shefa. Light. Abundance. But not only abundance of people flocking towards him, trying to see him, trying to touch him, trying to get a bracha from him, but even an abundance of attraction of what? Of even physical objects. Of even uh, materialistic things. To the point where the Gemara says, when Yosef at Sadiq, he was king, Melech Mitzrayim, all the people of the world came down to Egypt. And all the valuables of the world came down to Egypt too. Where all the money and all the gold and all the crops and all the valuables, they were in the hands of who? They were all in the hands of Yosef. Why is that? It all comes from the simple rule that we just established, being that the job of Adam is having the creation work for him. And when a man is in the aspect of tzaddik, he is firstborn. When he is firstborn, second, third, fourth, etc., they flock to him to come to a place of wholesomeness. And that wholesomeness is essentially is the, 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 um, 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 the, the source of what caused him to have bracha. So Yosef HaTzadik didn't have to work the fields didn't have to work hard for the crops, didn't have to do negotiation for his uh, valuables, 
he sat down like Adam, and the world, from every direction, flocked to him. Being that that flocking motion, like we mentioned before, was what? Not being an aspect of the people just bringing down their money or their valuables, but being that valuables hold what? A spiritual entity, but more specifically, a what? No? No. What do, what do valuables have that uh, not valuables don't have? Extra spirituality. That the extra spirituality is what caused them to become valuables from the first place. So now we can truly get a better picture of what is Yosef HaTzadik and how Yosef HaTzadik reached to such an abundance. Being that he only attracted what hell had within it enough spirituality to get up and to move towards him. And here we see Yosef HaTzadik coming as a slave, sitting down, not doing anything, and becoming the man that holds all the wealth, all the diamonds, all the gold, and all the kavod of the entire world. Kula. Being that he represented Adam. But not Adam after the sin. He represented Adam, a complete Adam. Adam that all the creation flocked to him to worship him. And this is essentially what we see even with Am Yisrael. In Am Yisrael is a very unique nation. We're a minority. Without a doubt. Every place we go, we always the Jews are able to amass what? No what? They're able to amass what? A lot of wealth. So you can think, ah, the non-Jews, they say because we're smart. I don't think we're that smart. I don't think we're that smart. I meet a lot of people. And I meet sometimes a lot of goyim. And we say, chokhmah ba goyim ta'amin. Knowledge in the goyim, you have to believe. Meaning, uh, 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 a, a non-Jew's ability to have great uh, uh, smartness and being very, very uh, knowledgeable, that you need to trust. So if that is the case, it means that smart, that's not what makes us so successful. So what is? So we have to come to understanding that there's some sort of spiritual uh, uh, occurrence that's happening that's causing Jews to be so successful. So what is it? It's very simple. If we are first born, then what holds most spiritual entity, what holds most spiritual value, will always be attracted to a Jew. Being that the more spiritual that that object has, the more it wants to reach us, because if it reaches us, we can bring it to a place of shlemut. Send it up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Redirect it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So Jews, in every single place we go, we attract what? All the wealth. Being that we are Adam, the creation needs to work for us. The, the creation is attracted to us. And the more spiritual whatever object, whatever animal holds, the more it flocks to us in a more uh, uh, direct way. And that's the reason that we believe that Jews are so successful and they have like a talent in amassing very valuable objects. Being that it's in their teva, the object moved towards them without even them trying to do anything. And that is the secret of, of Beta Migdash. What is Beta Migdash? Beta Migdash, the Gemara says, Beta Migdash was created to create converts. What does that mean? And there's so many stories in the Gemara where it says that Goyim that would just walk by Yerushalayim and they would see Bet HaMikdash. What would happen to them? They would, they, immediately they say, I want to convert. I want to convert. And not only that, kings would send their gifts to Bet HaMikdash of hundreds of thousands of sheep and, and cows. How do you think they did so many shechitot? They did thousands of of Kaubanot every single day. Where did it come from? So in reality, people were just sending gold and sheep and cattle and the most material things to Bet Amigdash. Why is that? Being that all these material things were attracted to a place where their spiritual value can be completed. And that's why Bet Amigdash in its essence was a hub of just attraction of value and people and kavod and these very, very unique things. Being that it was, in, in essence, the Bechor, the Reshit, the root that directs all to HaKadosh Baruch That's also the secret of a, a man. And the secret of how a man reaches to Panasa. You want to reach to Panasa? It's very simple. Make your home into a Bet Amikdash. Make your surroundings into a Bet Amikdash. 
if you will be able to make your surroundings to a Bet HaMikdash, to a place where all physical gets completed to HaKadosh Baruch with its spiritual spark, then all the physical will run towards it. It's like you can imagine there's a city that everybody is sick. And one person found a house that has a cure. What will happen? All the city will run toward, toward the house. Even the objects will be pulled towards the man that the spirituality within that object can be completed. In order to reach to a place of panasa within our own homes, the first of all, it needs to come from what? From reaching to a place where we create our home to be a Bet Mikdash. Meaning a home Kadosh. And that home Kadosh becomes the same reason that makes us firstborn, not being that we're not actually firstborn. That we hold extra spirituality that gives us that entitlement of like we are firstborn. And that's how we can reach to Shefa. Only by using that extra spirituality of taking whatever creations, animals, uh, 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 whatever it is, and turning it towards the Kaddish Baruch Hu, And more and more will come. Because it's being pulled to it. It's what attracts it all. Now this is something that the Goim knew. This is something that Yetzirah knows. This is something that Yetzirah tries to prevent. Because in every place that Bnei Israel come, all the Goim know that what? That all the wealth will be accumulated by them. So Yetzirah and the Goim, being that they are so smart, they know the secret. And they know the secret how to cause a Ben Israel, a firstborn, to lose his entitlement of firstborn. How so? Very, very simple. What causes a man, like we mentioned, to have the entitlement of firstborn, it comes from the fact that he has extra Kedusha. Take away that extra Kedusha, and what happens? You are no longer firstborn, you become second, or you become third, or you become a million. So what causes us to be firstborn is, like we mentioned, not being that we're actually firstborn, it's being that we hold this abundance of spirituality. So the Goim know it's very simple. If we want to cut B'nai Israel from this ability of accumulation, we just have to cut their spirituality. And once we will cut the spirituality, not only that they will not amass wealth and uh, they will become uh, kings, but they will become slaves to the nature. So the concept is simple. When we are tzaddik, meaning concept of tzaddik, we call it in Hebrew p'china, which p'china is a word that there's almost no, no actual translation in. When we are p'china of tzaddik, the nature worships us, like Adam, that the nature ran to him. When we lose our tzitkut and we lose our firstborn, it switches. And what happens? We become slaves to who? We become slaves to the nature. It sounds very familiar because that's what happened with Adam. When Adam Arishon sinned and he lost his extra kedusha, he lost with it his firstborn. When he lost his firstborn, did the creation worship him? Not at all. It says that Adam, HaKadosh Baruch told Adam, go work the fields. You can't sit like a king and have everything come towards you. Those days are finished. You lost your tzitkut. Now you need to go and run after the creation and work for the creation and become a slave for the creation. Only when you will become a slave for the creation will, will you be able to have some sort of sustenance. You have to chase after it. This brings us to a great understanding of the bracha of Yaakov and Yitzchak. Yaakov and Esav, or Yitzchak, the bracha of Yitzchak. We see that Yaakov is, knows something that we don't, clearly. Because he's so adamant, adamant, adamant. adamant to achieve the firstborn. To the point where he goes through so many lengths just to have his title the firstborn. What's so important of having a title of firstborn? And second of all, how is it that Yitzchak actually blessed Yaakov and, it, and Esav with the same blessing, which the blessing will be that you will be a king over your brother and you will lead your brother and your brother will become your slave. And th the blessing was given to both of them. So, how does, how does that make sense? So based on this, we can understand something very simple. What Yaakov was so adamant to achieve was what? Firstborn. 
Firstborn in his essence, meaning that he has the abundance of Kedusha. And if he has the abundance of Kedusha, then normally, naturally, the bracha of Esav being the nature will serve as what? As a slave. And the nature will run after Yaakov to worship Yaakov. But if Chas Shalom Yaakov wasn't tzaddik, and he lost its tzitzkut, and he lost the firstbornhood, what would happen? The bracha of Yitzchak to Esav would come true. Where Esav, being what represents nature, will be what? Will lead Yaakov. And Esav will essentially be um, what Yaakov worships. And this is this concept of when we are in the path of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we are firstborn, we attract. When we lose that connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we become slaves. And we need to chase. And that was the beginning of the slavery of Am Yisrael. When Bnei Israel, meaning the actual 12 tribes, the kids of Israel, being Yaakov, came down to Egypt, the Torah was very clear that they were kings. They didn't work. They didn't have to buy and sell. They didn't have to do anything. They sat, and Egypt gave them respect and money and wealth and food and cattle and all what they could desire. But we see that there was a turning point. What was the turning point? Torah says when Levi died. Once Levi passed away, B'nai Israel started to fall into slavery. So our question is, why Levi's death brought slavery upon Klal Am Yisrael? The answer being very simple. Levi, it says he was the Rav of the family. In what sense? In the sense that he was essentially uh, one of the more spiritual, involved a brother out of all the 12 tribes. Being that Levi passed away, which essentially we know that Levi, all his kids continued to study and they didn't leave the Torah. Meaning that what? That Bnei Israel started to lose their direction of what? Of Kedusha. Losing their direction of Kedusha would impose and would mean that they are also losing their right of what? Firstborn. And once they lose firstborn, not only that they don't become the entity that everyone worship, but they become what? The slaves that need to worship the creation itself. And we see that at the right, at the turning point when Bnei Yisrael started to enter into Tum'ah. Where once Bnei Yisrael started to enter into impurity, they lost their grasp on greatness. And they became slaves, the same way Adam Arishon became slaves to the creation itself after the sin. So this whole concept of the slavery of Am Yisrael comes from the simple fruition of what? From the simple fact of Bnei Israel losing their firstbornhood, the same way Adam Arishon lost, lost his firstbornhood at the time of the sin. In the same way, Chaz a person can lose his firstbornhood. If we leave Akadosh Baruch Hu and we take out the extra Kedusha that we have, we are like everybody. We are like every other person in the world. We become like non-Jew. And when we, when we become non-Jew, we lose that spice that makes Jews so successful. We lose that spice that makes you deem that everywhere we go, we achieve and we conquer and we, we, we uh, accumulate and we have more bacha and more bacha. It comes from the essence of us holding that Kedusha. That being the case. HaKadosh Baruch Hu started to do the Makot started to clean Bnei Israel by giving them faith in Emunah, Bnei Israel started to leave what? They started to leave their old ways. And they started to connect to what? To HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Being that they're connecting to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and they're going in a new path, it would mean that what? What's inevitable to come? Extra Kedusha, which would cause what? A shift. A shift of what? A shift from Bnei Israel being everybody else to being what? Firstborn. And once Bnei Israel would be firstborn, what would come as a result of that? What would come as a result of that is that slavery gets cancelled and the creation starts to worship. The creation starts to gather around Am Israel. Wealth starts to gather around Bnei Israel. And all the nations of the world start to gather around Am Israel. In the exact same way where it says that at the time of the Geulah, the time of the redemption, Goim will stay alive. 
in every midrash that talks about Mashiach and the Geula, it says that the world will continue and Goim will continue to function and thrive. The difference is that the Goim, what will be their role? They will be serving us. They will be serving B'nai Israel. Wait, ask, what is this concept of serving B'nai Israel? Well, now it makes sense. Being that we are firstborn, the creation flocks around Am Yisrael to give, to reach to a place of completing their spiritual spark within every single object, within every single creation. Being that it was a time of redemption, we need to make that shift. That shift would mean making B'nai Israel Bechorim, and doing what? And starting to allow the creation to start worshipping B'nai Israel as firstborn. But there was a problem. What was the problem? The problem that the Egyptians mistaken their role in the world. In what sense? They mistaken their role being the fact that their success didn't come from them. It came from the fact of what? Having B'nai Israel within them. Meaning that to a certain extent, the mistake that Egypt did, when they looked at themselves and they said, Rega, 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 one moment. If all the world are flocking to us, and all the wealth is flocking to us, it means that we are, no, firstborn. And if we are firstborn, then we are leading, and that's why B'nai Israel are slaves to us. When HaKadosh Baruch wanted to do the redemption, he needed to make this correction. This correction would meaning taking away the firstborn hood from the Egyptians and giving the firstborn hood to Am Yisrael. But in order to do so, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, only I can do so. Only I could inaugurate my children and put my children in the place of a firstborn place. And once they reach to an aspect of firstbornhood, it would mean that what can immediately start? The promise that was given to Bnei Israel that they will amass great wealth can start too. So HaKadosh Baruch tells Moshe, Moshe, tell Bnei Israel right when the, when the firstborn plague starts, Tell them to run to all the houses and to start accumulating. Because now, even within the nature of the objects, they will be pulled to Am Yisrael. And that is the same reason that the Egyptians did the silly act of what? Of putting wealth and jewelry and all their money in their pockets to go fight Bnei Israel. Being that it wasn't even within them that they did that act. It was within the spirituality that existed within themselves and within the objects pulled themselves towards B'nai Israel as worshipping the firstborn. From here we can understand this role and this secret of, of amassing Shefa. Amassing Shefa is not something that we can do with our own hands. Amassing Shefa is something that we do our effort to become a keli, to become a vessel, and we receive. The nature gives. But in order for the nature, and in order for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, like we read today, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Lakol, in order for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to give, we must reach first of all to an aspect of what? Firstborn. And if we will reach the aspect of firstborn, meaning extra Kedusha, we will automatically be like a normal, like the nature of a Jew is to amass and to amass and to grow in all the aspects. In physical, which also gives us opportunity to amass in spiritual as well. Now the question that everybody is thinking. Tov, we understood. We understood that amassing wealth is becoming firstborn, that the wealth runs after us. How do we become firstborn? How we, how we, we, we put ourselves this sticker that Yaakov did, uh, 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 that Yaakov did the sticker that Allah Tzadikim did, of being firstborn, and being firstborn, having the right for all the creation to worship him. How do we do so? So we said, you know, maybe we can understand something with the first pasuk of this week's parasha. We say, paro etam. What does that mean? It means that paro gets up and yella. He says, it's time to send Bnei Yisrael out of Egypt. So, What's very strange is that the wording that the Torah uses is a little bit different. In what sense? Vayehi 
is a lashon of what? Tar. What does that mean? What does that mean? Something bad. So any place in the Torah it says vayehi, it refers that something bad is happening. So the question is, what is the bad that's happening with shlichut paro? Vayehi b'shalach paro. I found a beautiful pirush that's one of the Talmudim of the Rizal right? that I think is so important and so crucial to understand how we reach to this level. The Rizal says that when Pa'os sent Bnei Israel out of Egypt, he sent them in the right path. He, told, he said, look, Am Israel, there is Am Israel, there is Eret Israel. Walk straight there, you will reach to Eret Israel. The shlichut of Pa'os even though it was a shlichut of man, a uh, sending of man, which looked to be the correct path, being the fact that it is a shlichut, a sending of the nature, in its essence means that it's going to end up being what? A bad path. Paro was man. He was Adam. Listening and taking Paro's uh, direction. Is it nature or it's Hashem? Nature. It's nature. Just the fact that Paro was the one that sent Bnei Israel straight and said, that's Eret Israel, it was already a very bad thing that occurred. Why? Being that Paro was the one that did it, that it came from the aspect of the nature, Bnei Israel, if they walk in that path, only bad will follow. Only bad will occur. Being that the right path that Yetzirah gives, that Paro gives, even though it seems to be the smart way and it seems to be the correct way, it will always end up in complete tragedy. And on the opposite side, Akadosh Baruch Hu, when he leads Bnei Israel and Am Israel, sometimes it tends to be a very, very strange way. Like with Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Hashem tells Bnei Israel, walk with me uh, uh, to the desert. And he actually directs them towards what? The exact opposite direction of Eretz Yisrael. But that opposite direction that HaKadosh Baruch Hu led Bnei Yisrael was for a very, very, very important reason. It was for the reason of what? It was for the reason of bringing Bnei Yisrael to a place of understanding that in order to reach to success, you cannot follow man. To, in order to reach to bracha, you need to follow only one. That one being who? Kadosh Baruch Hu. When we follow Kadosh Baruch Hu blindly, with emunah, in a calm manner, we create a direct connection. That direct connection with Kadosh Baruch Hu, in his essence, is that extra kedusha that can allow us to become a firstborn. Maybe we can say that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent Bnei Yisrael from Egypt, He sent them purposely towards Yamsuf. Towards a path that Bnei Yisrael would be challenged with the test of whether or not this is the right way, or whether or not it's the wrong way. And being that even though it looks to be like the wrong way, we have to remember and we have to be calm that it's what? It, it's going to end up being the proper way. We see this where? We, th- we see this when Hashem when Moshe gets pressured by Am Yisrael, it says that when Bnei Yisrael reached to the ocean, they looked in front and they said, what are we doing? There's ocean in front. Behind us there is the Egyptians. To the left there is animals. To the right there is desert. What direction do we go? So Moshe Rabbeinu started to pray to Hashem. He started to panic. What does Hashem tell him? What does Hashem tell him? He says, no, 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 stop praying. What are you doing? It's not a time for prayer. Why is it not a time for prayer? Because it's a time for being calm. In what sense? It's a time for putting your trust in Hashem. The fact that you are panicking and you are praying, you're ruining what I'm trying to accomplish. I'm trying to connect myself with Am Yisrael. I can't connect myself if you're panicking. Be calm. Walk in the bad way. Walk into the ocean. And that bad way, that crooked way, that way that seems to be the opposite direction will end up being the, the direction of what? direction of Gewula. The essence of this, we can see it's like, like to give an analogy. It's like a son that's on the shoulders of his father. And they're trying to go home. 
And the father takes him towards muddy, muddy paths and paths with kotsim, uh, mm-hmm. thorns and uh, cliffs and all that. Will the son question his father whether this is the right path? No. He knows that the father is the one that's carrying him. He knows that the father is the one that's taking him. He knows that the father wants to take him to home, to a safe place. And even though this seems to be a bad direct, it seems to be a bad path, it will lead us where? It will lead us to home. It will lead us to a place of shalva, a place of wholesomeness. But without that initial trust of the child just believing in the father and allowing the father to, to lead, knowing that the father wants the best, the father will never be able to take his child home, will never be able to come to a place of Gula. In the essence of the whole parasha, the goal of Akadosh Baruch Hu was to bring Bnei Israel in a way, into a path of what? Of complete wholesomeness and calmness and no stress of who is leading him and that the path is the correct path, even though it seems to be hard. You can see this as just as another reference to add it. Yosef. Yosef represents man being Bechor, man being a firstborn that accumulated all the wealth. Did Yosef look panicked at any part of his life? He was sold as a slave. He was calm. When he got to, to the jail, it said that the two, uh, Sarah Mashkim and Sarah, Sh- and, uh, and Sarah Ophim, they were looking, at, sitting in the jail. The Midrash says, black and white, Yaakov looks at them and says, why are you panicking? Why are you so afraid? Yosef in his essence represents what? He represents being calm, knowing that our father is leading. And when we know that our father is leading, we create a bond and a connection that makes us a firstborn from the first hand. Maybe we can say that once Bnei Yisrael proved that connection and proved by that trust by jumping into the ocean, jumping into a crooked <coughs> path, which having the faith in them that it will be the right path, maybe that was the connection that caused them to reach this place of firstborn from the first hand. Where can we see this? How can we prove this? Very simple. Once Bnei Israel saw that Hashem tore the sea, what did they start doing? What did they start doing? As Yashir. What's Yashir? Song. What do we call Shabbat? Parashat? Shira. What's this Shira? What's this Shira? What's this song that Bnei Israel are singing? What's this song that we're calling this parasha named after this song? Maybe we can say that um, Shira, if we take the same letters and we just reorganize them, it's the same letters of what? Yashar. What's Yashar? Straight. Straight to what? Straight to HaKadosh Baruch And that's what we say, as Yashir, that in the future we will reach again to this place of what? Of Shira, of what? Of Yosher connection, like of straight, um, clear, um, stiff, strong connection with Aitoid Bach, that will cause us to become, once again, complete firstborns. From this entire parasha, Botai, we can understand that in, in, in essence of reaching to Shefa and Bacha and Panasa, it all comes from the simple fact that we take, we take it for such simplicity when it's not, of understanding, believing, and being calm, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he is taking us in the right path. And when we hold that emunah within us, we immediately bring upon us such a presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that we end up having all the creation worship us. And when all the creation worship us, we have the ability to take that creation and to redirect it towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to do like our part of, of creating a cycle of light from, from bottom to up towards HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The secret of reaching to an accumulation of spiritual valued objects which are very uh, valuable ones in today's society is coming to a place of understanding that whether or not the path looks hard or easy or soft or hard or spiky or soft or not spiky or good or bad is remembering that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is our father HaKadosh Baruch Hu's path and direction will always be the direction the path that will lead us Be'erat Hashem to our bite to our place of comfort which is Be'erat Hashem the time of Biyat HaGoyim. It's Bezrat Hashem. In the middle of the Tzadik, Abichayim Pinto. In the middle of the Tzadikim, 
May we achieve, Be'ezat Hashem, this aspect of firstborn, or in other words, abundance of Kedusha, that we will, Be'ezat Hashem, attract all the creation to us, and the creation will worship us in order that we can worship HaKadosh Baruch Hu in the most uh, perfect and happy, Be'eter, Ve'lo Be'isu, Be'nachat, Ve'lo Be'tzar, Be'shalva, Ve'lo Be'zui. And then may HaKadosh Baruch Hu Be'at Hashem give us all big Yeshuot and Smachot. And... Um, Amen. So, is there any questions? If there's no questions, we have big problems. Any questions? Ken Sadika. You know who has challenges too? Tzadikim. And kids of Tzadikim. You know, it says that people think that Tzadikim have less challenges. It's the exact opposite. Tzadikim have more challenges. It says that the level, depending on the level you are, that's the test that you're going to be tested with. So firstborn, being that they have more Kedusha, also implies that they're going to have more Nisayon. Yitzhah wants a bigger piece of them. They're more valuable to Yitzhah. So obviously firstborn will have a lot of challenges. Because firstborn have more Kedusha. They're born at a higher level. And being that they're born at a higher level, they will have more challenge. Especially in reality, the Jewish people look different the way it was supposed to look. Initially, at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim, all the firstborn were Kohanim. So this entire class would have been something that we would have learned in Gan, in, in, Gan, in uh, the first grade. Because if that was the case that all firstborn or, 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 are Kohanim, it would make sense that the Kohan, they go to Petamikdash, he's the one that's dealing with all the gold and the leathers and the these expensive, lavish um, tools, being that he is the firstborn, he's attracting that, uh, that, uh, that kdusha, that spirituality that exists within more valuable uh, materials. So, firstborns, before the sin of the golden calf, any family could have, was supposed to have a Kohen. Meaning, uh, Rabbi Uda is the firstborn, <laughs> So Rabbi Yehuda would go to Bet HaMikdash, even if he was a different family. There wasn't Kohen. There wasn't con- Kohen was for all, fa- all Am Yisrael. That was one of the fights of Korach. Korach wanted all Am Yisrael to keep the, fir- to keep the ko- Kehuna, to keep this extra Kedushat the firstborn had. So before the sin, we were all, all, the, all the firstborn that were supposed to be true a property of Hashem. Property of Hashem that would serve us to worship Hashem. Being, again, this exact same concept of Adam, of Yosef, of, of our world and our, of our job today. So, after the sin, HaKadosh Baruch Hu took out Kiuna from firstborn, meaning took out the crown of Kohen from the firstborn and gave it only to Aaron. And, what, and he told Aaron, Aaron, you and your kid will be Kohanim. And that's where Kiuna comes from. But the Kiuna was supposed to belong to the firstborn, being at the firstborn who hold more Kedusha. So, of course, they will have more challenges. It's like they say that a non-Jewish body, someone, some man uh, did this research, I don't know. I don't really care about researches, so I don't... Uh, uh, he did this uh, Mikhkar, I don't know how you call it. Mikhkar is research, right? Yes, about this is what he, he told us at least so I'm not going to uh, that Jewish bodies for some reason tend to decompose much slower than non-Jewish bodies it's very strange that so we thought we said maybe we say that, the, that the Jewish body in its essence Yitzhah doesn't want it to compose it wants it to, it wants to sort of feed off of it it has more Kedusha so it takes longer for it to break apart the non-Jewish body doesn't have that much Kedusha so it's the ground, it, it goes through it quickly. Being that, that the Jewish body has more Kedusha, it takes longer. It's a thought. Maybe we'll make a class on it one day. We do classes on uh, very unique subjects. Is there any other question? Can, can I be David? So essentially what you're saying is the way to amass wealth and everything is, is to get Kedusha, to basically have Amuna, right? So, yes, but you know, a lot of the times there's this misunderstanding within Judaism that everything is about um, 
zero. It happened. How? No explanation. But there is an exp- there is a reason. There's, there's a process behind all, and that's really what the Zohar Kadosh helps us with. When we do a mitzvah, we see it as it's to wash your hands. Why do I have to wash my hands in the morning? I didn't, I didn't touch anything. So, some mitzvot have more explanation, some have less. Some mitzvot have much less explanation, much less understanding of why we do what we do. Regardless of what mitzvah and what the explanation and what chazal exposed to it, there is, like we say in Hebrew, procedura. there is a... Uh, huh? Procedure, a sequence that causes something specific to happen. So we mentioned right and left, have a Hashem will give you panasa. Why? Why is that the reason that Hashem will give me panasa? What's the procedure behind it for me to understand why doing that will help me? So now we understand. Now we understand by having more emunah and underst- blind, uh, 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 walking blindly, it connects us with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Once we're connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we have an extra Kedusha. That extra Kedusha gives us an ability to be like firstborn. Firstborn, the creation works for you. So now you understand the procedures. Now you understand why it's so important to have Imuna. So that being said, every year we tell people, every year we have Tuesday night class. So every year we always bring up the subject on the Tuesday that it falls on. So last year, for example, we spoke about there's no hocus pocus uh, behind reading the man. Read past the man. People think, ah, the letters are sequenced to create a, something, a change in, in, in the world about it. <laughs> That's not the case at all. We tell people, if you're going to read past the man, you don't understand it, don't read it. That's not the segula. The segula is not, we're just reading, it's not teilim. Where reading it gives you merit. Reading Parashat Aman, there's a reason. Be- What's the reason? The reason behind it is understanding, ah, B'nai Israel were 40 years in the desert. The man came every morning. Meaning that tomorrow, you didn't know if you had food or not. So you need to have every night faith that Hashem what? Brings Panasa. So every night, all Am Israel had no choice but to have full belief that Hashem brings Panasa because there's nothing else to do. That was their only option. And the man kept on coming. And the ones who didn't have that emunah, that's faith, so they collected for two days, ended up losing their panasat ease. They ended up needing to travel, to work hard to find their man. Where it says that the more, if, you, if a person said, you know, I'm going to cheat, I'm going to collect for two days, the next day his man would, 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 uh, would fall far away. So he had to work hard for it. So you see that the concept of reading Parashat Aman today is not from a reason of making a spell. There's no spell, no such thing. Even with Tfilot, when you read, it's not uh, the words will change our, our life. No, it's that the Tfilah, what we read, is meant to position us, to teach us something, to give us a lesson, to give us a, 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 an understanding of something. So once we come to understanding of, wow, Panasa comes from Hashem, the same way the man came, my panasa, I should act the same very way. So it's obvious that you have more panasa. Being a panasa comes from not you working, from you not working. So and believing that that, that Baruch Hu panasa So at what point, for example, there's a doctor and a lawyer and a businessman, all of them have their own type of work. One, one might be harder than the other, one might be easier. So we always mention this concept of istadlut because a lot of times there's a big lining of, of when work becomes excessive and becomes no longer seeking panasa but just wasting time. So istadlut first of all is creating keli, creating a vessel. With that in itself, we did a class about it a few weeks ago, uh, a few months ago already now. And it was right in the beginning of wow, wow, it was Noach. Pashat Noach. Just this concept of creating a vessel is already a world of its own. Meaning that what? You need to create opportunity for Hashem to be able to give you. So for example, you want to win the lottery. What do you, do? What do you need to do? If, if, you're, if Hashem loves you, what do you need to do? You have to buy a ticket. If you buy the ticket, you create a vessel where if Hashem loves you and He wants to give you, now He has a way to give you. 
So the first level is creating a keli, meaning creating an opportunity. Wherever your opportunity is maxed, there Hashem can also, that's, that's his maximum he can give you. So for example, if you now, <laughs> oh, if there's a city that only needs one cup a day, and you open up a cup store, so you know that Hashem's maximum bacha that he can give you is what? One cup a day. So there's the concept of creating a kili. And we always encourage people, widen your kili. Make what, the ability for Hashem to give you more possible. That's why we don't like people that work uh, on hour. You work on hour, Hashem, Hashem's not going to suddenly add you more hours in the day to work more hours in the day. So you created a vessel. The vessel is two ounces. Hashem fills two ounces. So that's one thing that we have to put in the sign. The second concept, which they are entangled, but also separate, is this concept of ishtatlut being maximum work. What does that mean? It means we have to do our maximum. And once we do our maximum, we leave it to Hashem. And that's where our imuna comes in. Because it's very um, counterintuitive, you can call it. On one side, they believe in Hashem, He gives you all, then go work. Huh. If Hashem gives me all, why go to work? It's counterintuitive, of, just logic. If Hashem gives all, why work? Where does it come in? So, no, so the concept is that you do your effort, your ishtad, your maximum, and then the rest Hashem does. So ishtad does not mean minimum, it means maximum. People think effort means not minimum. No, effort means maximum. Meaning you're doing your part. You're doing the maximum you can do. Afterwards, it's not in your hands. And you have to believe it's not in your hands. <coughs> and even if it seems to be a bad path, we have to have a that our Father will take us in the end to a good place. And there's so much more. We can talk hours upon this. Hours just on this concept of effort. What is effort? What is the story you can bring of a... What does effort mean? Uh, on one side, and there's a concept of keli, b'nyata keli, shbirata keli, the breaking of the vessel. It's, it's a world, Abitali, it's a world. So, to keep it in our answer, in essence, maximum is effort, and our job is uh, to build the keli, most importantly. Because if we build, some people build the keli, and they did their effort, then they go in retirement, then they make, and they have. So they built a good keli, that's what they did. They built a really good keli. And they did their effort. But their keli was substantial enough for, 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 for Hashem to have enough space to give him shefa for many years. So, keli, effort, imuna. Keli, effort, and imuna, that, that is your job of, of work. More than that, you don't need. Less than that, you won't have a person who has a Is there any other questions? Can you know that uh, last week, Parshat Hashem, it says that uh, why Machat Echorot? So at the time, we fully understand the concept of Bnei Bukhari Yisrael. Mm -hmm. That's exactly this concept, no? So if that happened last week, and Parshat Hashem, why would this week's Parshat that we needed uh, Kriyat Yamsu to emphasize that point? No, so first of all, the concept of um, what we just mentioned, what, what the Siddiq just mentioned, is what, what we mentioned earlier. In what, in what manner? Being that now HaKadosh Baruch Hu needs to make sure the Egyptians understand that they're no longer the firstborns. They're not firstborn. B'nai Israel is firstborn. That's why the Makkah of Bechot was Makkah Bechot. But still, their connection was not, was not strong. It was not, uh, it was not the same way it was in Kram Israel. They still doubted HaKadosh Baruch Hu when, he, when they were sent by Pao. Some said, I want to go back. When they were in Yam Suf, it says, Meaning that even the slave in Kirat Yam Suf had such an understanding of Hashem and such a connection to Hashem that even the prophets of Yechizkel Ben Buzi couldn't reach to. So we cannot compare Hashem setting up the stage to release his kids to Bnei Issa doing their part of becoming Bechot. And just to add to that, you could even say that's the concept on Pesach. Just I know there's so much to add, we don't have a lot of time. But in Pesach, even the poor people, it says you have to do Aseva. To teach that even the simple person needs to sit like a king. And if a simple person sits and relaxes like a king, you will end up having being wealthy. That's just another add. 
Any other questions? Ken Sadika. Ken. למה תצעק אליי? דבר בני ישראל ועיסאו, כן? means move. Just move. Just don't panic, just move, be calm. No, the fact that you're screaming to Hashem, it means that you are in a lack of a... We didn't finish your answer, by the way. Um, um, the fact that you are screaming to Hashem, it, it's, it's, it's a lack of, of being calm. It's, it's you are thinking, no, this path that Hashem sending me is a bad one. Hashem needed in B'nai Yisrael to understand this path it seems to be bad, but it's a good path. Believe in your father. To go back to what Abim Michael was mentioning before, the concept of Kadesh, of Kadesh Likol Becho, it's within the Tfilin. Kadesh Likol Becho is the last parasha within the Tfilin. No. Shema Yisrael, Vayim Shamoa, Kadesh Likol Becho, Vayak Yviyacha. It's not. Don't we know what Kadesh Likol Becho, Vayak Yviyacha, Shema, Vayim Shamoa? No. No, no. Our tefillin order is Shema Yisrael, Vayayim Shamoa, Rashi, Michael is right. Kedesh Likol Bechol Vayayim Shamoa, Rashi, it's backwards. Rashi, it's Vayayim Shamoa, Shema Yisrael, Michael, Rashi, it's proper. Shema Yisrael, Vayayim Shamoa, Rabbeinu Tam, it's backwards. It's Vayayim Shamoa, Shema Yisrael. So no, it's a different, it's a different shoe. But Rashi says that because the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat and Kuf Yud Chet, if I'm not mistaken, Kuf Yud Gimel, Kuf Yud Gimel, Kuf Yud Chet, one of the two. So the Gemara says that the order of the parashot need to be Kadesh Likol Bechor, Vayak Yaviyacha, and the other two. But the Gemara doesn't say the order of the other two. It just says the other two. So the order of the, the other two, Rashi says, in the order of the Torah, meaning Shema, Vayim, Shema, Rabbi Lutam says, no, he found Tfilin from Moshe Rabbeinu's generation that uh, had Vayim, uh, Shema, uh, Shema. It's a different, completely different uh, world of its own. Tov Tzadikim.